Hello and welcome to Save Your Sanity. I'm Dr. British Shaler. I'm here with my guest, Susan Bratton, and we are going to have a great in-depth, just us folks conversation mm -hmm. about how do you transform having sex into making love. So welcome to the show, Susan. Great to see you, Roberta. And thank you for picking such a topic near and dear to my heart, passionate lovemaking. Yes. Well, we'll get into the passion, but a couple of questions just before we leap sure. in. Um, is it really necessary to transform having sex into making love, or is it all right on some level to just enjoy having sex? Let's start there. Well, I think that generally there are some people for whom friction might be enough, but I don't think most people, I don't think people with a heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, really my flavor of teaching lovemaking techniques is this notion of being heart connected. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a lot of men, and I'm, I'm going to do a little stereotyping here, um, because it is how the world runs on a bell curve, that gen men really need to learn how to connect their heart to their genitals, where women start with heart connected already to genitals. Their, our female genitals don't necessarily operate as easily without heart connection. That being said, there are some women who are happy just with a more transactional experience. But the great large cluster of us female bodied people, we want... <laughs> We want to feel the love during sex. Yeah. And when men discover it and they learn how to connect their heart to their genitals and it's suggested to them, one of, one of the easiest things about being a sex expert, in all honesty, is that what I do is I just explain how things work to people. Oh, you would mm -hmm. like to transform friction into love? Okay, <laughs> here are the things that you do. And the minute you hear them, they're easy to do. You just didn't know what to do. Often what I find is that the way that I connect with people is I inspire them, I give them the permission to have what they want, and I tell them what it is that they want in a way that they can access it and say, yeah, that's, that is what I wanted. I just didn't know that what I was getting wasn't it but I mm. knew it wasn't quite right. And that's easy because the minute you hear it, you think, all right, I can do that. And that is what I want. Thank you so much. So I do have it easy in, in many ways. I, I can be a, a superhero to people because just putting it into words and showing them what is possible is 90% is of it. Wow. Well, I'm glad that it's that easy. Yeah. I have deeper questions and I want to tell everybody that yeah. I'm talking with Susan Bratton and she is an amazing intimacy intimacy expert to millions yes. <laughs> and she is the publisher of sex techniques and bedroom mm -hmm. communication skills and we're going to talk about all kinds of things related to the transformation of having sex to making love mm -hmm. and we're going to throw in that all important little question that i think it may be on most of the people's minds who have have been coming to my podcast for a while is does this work with a hijackal with a narcissistic hijackal can we actually make that transformation so you probably want the answer to that but we'll get to it so here we are we susan's just said that you, these connections that we have it could be as she said an exchange of friction which it can be an enjoyable experience but if you'd like to have it tied to your heart you might want to think a little more deeply about it mm. and make a few shifts so mm. that's important but how does a narcissistic person distinguish between having sex and making love well, a narcissistic person doesn't really care what it is, as long as they look great and they subjugate you. So as long as they're feeling their ego is propped up and they look good or they're a good lover, um, as long as they're getting that reflection, that's what they need. They think they are the center of the universe. Where passionate lovemaking is really, the, the difference is that when you make love with a lover, a beloved, you are merging 
two people together. And not just physically, but also spiritually, emotionally, through your heart, through your eyes, through your breath. You are co-creating pleasure in every moment together where you are right there with that person. You're not in your mind, in your head, strategizing. It's not that you're up here looking down on what's going on. You're right in it with the other person. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, we're, we're born in our little body containers and we die and pass in these little body containers. And though we love and are loved throughout our life, in some ways, being human is a bit lonely because we, we are kind of stuck in this container and all we ever really have is ourselves. But we can have great loves in our lives who provide us with comfort and connection and care and touch and oxytocin and joy and orgasm. And that is one of the times when, when we are truly making love, when the world falls away, when we're in the moment together, when, we're, when the interplay is happening in real time between two people where you don't know where your orgasm starts and your partner's orgasm ends, that you feel less alone. You feel like you've touched souls. And there is an entire category of spiritual sexuality called tantric lovemaking. And what tantric lovemaking does and there's even a practice called expanded orgasm, which some people call orgasmic meditation, mm -hmm. where you get into these heightened states of bliss together. And when you get into those heightened states of bliss, you merge as one, but you even go beyond that. You actually touch what some people call God or source or spirit. You feel a connection to all living things through your lovemaking. And I know for some people that might feel very distant and woo-woo, but it's actually a conjoined trance state. It's like co-meditating in orgasmic pleasure. Mm -hmm. And it's simply a learned skill, like all sex. That's what's so interesting about sexuality. You know, we can figure out how to procreate pretty easily. We can fumble <laughs> our way in the dark and that happens. But making love is actually a learned skill. And Having orgasmic pleasure is a learned skill and learning how to get into these conjoined trance states with partners where you, where you not only feel deeply tethered and connected to each other, but you, you feel connected to all souls. That pathway is available to everyone. It is a pathway of bliss. And I think that's, in a way, the, the pinnacle of, of our sexual potential is achieving that state with a lover. So that's a very different state than someone who's strategizing or manipulating you or just having sex to make themselves feel good yeah. or yeah. what have you, which is much more in the, the realm of narcissistic partnership. Mm -hmm. Or a tra transactional situation in order to, well, we'll do this and I will feel great about my performance. But on the other hand, you now will give me something because I have uh, deigned to bless you with my physical presence. <laughs> um, and, you know, we're not just talking about men here. We're talking about women. There are equal numbers of male and female uh, hijackals. They present a little differently. But when we look at the bedroom, you know, it's really difficult sometimes because we so much want to believe it's love when we are with a person with narcissistic tendencies or a hijackal of any stripe for that matter. Yeah. We so want to believe that they they value us, they love us, they're into us, they, they can hardly wait to create a life with us, they think we're wonderful, that we don't notice the performative aspects of it. Yeah. And then when it starts to be withdrawn, we begin to wonder, did all of our value go away? And so when it becomes performative and it is something you have to ask for because it is not offered, it's become transactional, that becomes a very, very difficult piece for people in relationships with these folks yeah. because now it is, okay, you want something, you know, 
do what I want you to do. Yeah. What are you going to give me? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And why? Why should I? I mean, I'm busy. I'm washing my hair or whatever I'm doing. Why should I deign to give you any pleasure? Um, because it's not what I want right now. It's not in my best interest. So it is a big piece to look at. But let's just talk about your specialty of creating intimacy mm -hmm. yes. and the various forms of intimacy that there are, because some people believe that the sex act itself is a very intimate thing. How would you determine the different kinds of intimacy? Well, I think there is, um, there's intimacy that is, I'm, I'm going to share parts of myself. I don't share with others. And then there's the intimacy of vulnerability. I'm going to allow you to see me naked. I'm going to surrender to my pleasure. I'm not going to care what it looks like or how it sounds. You're going to make me feel, you, you by being who you are, you make me feel like I'm supported and desired and allowed to just let go into my pleasure. Mm -hmm. These are some of the things um another might be oh i don't i don't feel well tonight i need to cancel our date okay darling well i if i were there i would just be petting your head and loving you like you love me when i don't feel well and i totally understand it versus what do you mean you're canceling you can't cancel you have a commitment to me just buck up and make it happen you know there's a, there's a wide range of responses and there are loving responses and there are selfish responses to mm -hmm. getting your own needs met in the way that you need them in the time that you need them and one of the things that one of the one of the biggest things that i help people with is something called the sexual soulmate pact it's an agreement between lovers to be able to ask for what you want when it, as it changes and evolves throughout a lovemaking session. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I say, I have a little kitty cat here. This is my little kitty cat in a lion's outfit. Sometimes, you know, we, we, we ebb and flow as, as humans, human beings. We are, if you think about human beings, we are, you imagine the tree of life and there's the, the dolphins and the kitty cats and the lions and the tigers and the ponies and the puppies and the whales and the dolphins. And then there's this this branch called the great apes and there's the bonobos and the orangutans and the, the, oh, the, the, the homo sapiens. And that's us. We're actually, we're actually primates. We're great apes. We don't sit down at the base of the tree of life and look up at the animals eating an apple. We're up in the tree with the animals because we are an animal. And because we're an animal, we're subject to the vagaries of our hormones. Uh, women on a 28-day lunar cycle, men on a daily cycle of testosterone dominance, being it being easy for them to be turned on and ready to go, mm -hmm. where for women, we need slower sex, more on-ramping, more full body touch. We're just a little further behind. I always say to my, my male followers, turn around and come back and get us and help us get into our turn on. Our arousal ladder is a slower arousal, arousal ladder. Our genitals don't fill with blood as quickly as our male bodied partners do. And we need things to be slower to allow us to get and catch up to our male body partners. And so with that 28 day cycle, we are, sometimes we are a lioness. And then I've got my, this is, this is believe it or not, a kitty cat costume <laughs> for <laughs> Halloween. <laughs> you can make your kitty cat into a lion or you can make your lion into a kitty cat. And so sometimes we are just a kitty cat and we need that petting. We need that full body petting. We need that slow loving. But other times we're like, we're ready to pounce. And it's honoring those differences and how we are every time. Oh, it's too hard. That's too much. Or, oh, I need it much harder. Having the confidence to ask for what you need and mm -hmm. having your partner love to hear what you need so they can give it to you so that, you know, a, a good lover wants to give you pleasure more than they want their own pleasure. They will just give up their pleasure to give you pleasure. They, they want you to be happy. They want you to enjoy yourself. So if you have a lover that's not doing that, that's selfish, that's taking their pleasure, mm -hmm. that isn't listening to your needs, or if you feel that you can't ask for what you need, if you feel like you are cowed, if you feel that you must submit, if you feel that things are always the way they want them, if you feel that you're 
desires and requests are not important, then you are with someone who is not a good lover, someone who is a selfish person. And those are very telltale signs. Now, a lot of women, interestingly, Dr. Shaler, a lot of women say to me, I don't know what I want. I just know what I'm getting isn't it. Right. That's that's the case, whether we're talking about sex or anything. <laughs> yeah. And what I say is, you actually do know that she knows what she wants. It's intuitively, if you allow yourself to trust your body wisdom, and I know that when you're dealing with people in narcissistic, narcissistic relationships, you're dealing with people who don't always trust their own judgment. That, their, that trust has been knocked out of them. Someone mm -hmm. else's judgment takes priority. But when you come back to ground, your ground, your essential self, deep inside you, your body has the wisdom and you have the intuition to listen to it or her, depending on whether you're male-bodied or female-bodied. I mean, one thing I will say too is that I support all gender expression, but we're born either XX or XY. We are born with a penis or we're born with a vagina. A vulva is usually that's the entire genital system actually is, is called the vulva. And we know what we want when we listen. And the more that we feel comfortable and safe asking for it, the better sex gets and the more love is co-created. Mm. That's one of the things that um, I, in this is one of the books that I've written that's a really popular one. It's called Sexual Soulmates, The Six Essentials for Connected Sex. And over the last 15 years in helping millions of people, I came up with what the six things are that really help you co-create that feeling that you're with your sexual soulmate. And you don't, your sexual soulmate is not out there waiting for you to find them. You co-create this experience with a lover by learning these skills and practicing these skills. And the sexual soulmate pact is one of them. And there are a couple of others that I mentioned, one of them being present, not being directive, not being your, not being up in your head, but being there, vulnerable, connected in the moment. That's really the very fundamental part of sexual soulmates. The second one is called lover space. That's setting setting up a room, setting up the space for making love. And I want to circle back to that because I think that that is something very important that a lot of people overlook that prevents you from having complete pleasure. The next one is the Sexual Soulmate Pact, which you can download at sexualsoulmatepact.com for free. It's the technique. It tells you exactly how to do it. Even if you're afraid to speak up, it turns you into a communication um, bedroom expert and your partner loves your feedback and you love theirs. The next is polarity. That's really, and I've got funny little, funny little things here, but I've got my favorite Ken doll, which is a surfer doll. Cause here I am at the beach. I love my surfer guys and my cute little Barbie. And it doesn't really matter what your gender expression is. There's, there's the masculine and the feminine and the balance of those two things depend that anybody can be the leader and anybody can be the follower. It doesn't really matter. But once you allow there to be that masculine feminine range of experience and lovemaking, the sex gets richer and more pleasurable. And a lot of people are very different outside the bedroom than they are in the bedroom. And the polarity of surrender, moving people forward, moving your body, allowing your nervous system to be taken over, being the giver and then the receiver, switching back and forth between the poles together, really ends up giving you a wide variety of pleasurable experiences, like the difference between missionary position with the man on top, where you're kind of, as the feminine, overwhelmed by the masculine, versus flipping that to what's called cowgirl sex position <laughs> and being on top and being the one in control of the motions and the thrusting and being the feminine, but being 
on the top is a very interesting difference in polarity. Playing with the range of that and having a partner who's willing and confident enough to play the range of that really makes sex fun. Because sex positions are one of a handful of ways that people keep sex exciting. What, trying new things in new locations, learning new skills, playing with and incorporating toys. These are some of the things that keep sex continuously growing and expanding rather than contracting and getting bored. So someone who wants to go through that and explore that with you, who's open to that, who isn't trying to control the scene all the time the way they want it, but who is willing to play that range with you is someone who becomes much more of a really fun lover. Right. And then, uh, go ahead. Just, just let me um, yeah. say that we do have people uh, joining us here. Great. And if you do have a question, be sure yeah. to put it in. We do have a comment from Ekaterina. She said that uh, she said it is important for narcissists to have a fan club. <laughs> so she wondered, you know, do they have a harem or a harem, whichever way you prefer to say it? Do they need to have more than one woman or can they be a one, a one woman man or a one man woman? Well, there are as many answers to that as there are days in the universe. Um, every single narcissist and or human being is going to have different responses. It's interesting that there are a lot of narcissists who have who are unwilling to commit and who will be dating around people who say, oh, I'm polyamorous or I have an open relationship because they're unwilling and, and unable to give their heart to someone. So um, there are a lot of narcissists hiding as polyamorists. I would say that. So a harem is maybe a, a more traditional word for someone who is serially dating or dating around or dating multiple people at one time. Mm -hmm. And a harem is also indicative that it's, uh, the man who has a lot of women, when there are a lot of women who also just want to have a lot of lovers and they don't want to be heart connected and they are interested in more friction than connection and um, they are there to be pleased. So it, like you said, Roberta, it's, it's across the gender spectrum. Narcissism right. runs thick and deep <laughs> Just like sociopathy. I mean, there are sociopaths. One in every 10 is a little on the sociopathic borderline somewhere. So, yeah, just have to watch out for people in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, um, <clears throat> I, I really want to always emphasize the fact that there are equal numbers of male and females. They present yes. differently, but yes. they, they're having the same things. And, you know, I created the term hijackal so we wouldn't have to use any clinical definitions. And always remember, a hijackal is a person who hijacks a relationship for their own needs and purposes yes. and then relentlessly scavenges it for power, status, and control. So if that's what you need, many times you will find that, as Susan said, they may may use different terminology, like I'm polyamorous or whatever, um, but they are actually saying that I have a need for power, status, and control, and I will get it met in whatever way I need to. Mm -hmm. So thanks for that comment, Ekaterina. And folks, if you do have a question, please be putting it in the chat. It takes about 20 seconds from when you hit send to when I see it, and we can talk about it. So if you're thinking of something right now, carry on. So I know I interrupted you in the middle of your oh, sixth okay. thing. So please, <laughs> please go back. And, and now we've uh, included people in the conversation. Great. Well, and I do want to say one last thing about the polyamory piece too. Polyamory is actually a relationship construct that means to love many. Polyamory means many loves. And there are legitimately excellent, kind, loving people who are in polyamorous relationships who have more than one partner. They're in a polyamorous trio or they're in a thruple or they're in a quad or we have lovers and they have lovers, but we're primary to our partnership. Um, and that doesn't mean they're narcissists. There are many people who are 
overflowing with love and connection and enjoy having multiple partners. And there are more and more of them today than ever because women have begun to have some financial parity, which means they are not necessarily in need of having the security and protection of someone. They can stand on their own and be a sovereign being and decide that they want more than one partner. So I just did want to, I just wanted to make sure we didn't paint people in open and poly relationships yeah. as narcissists. Really good point because it is a choice. And as you say, you know, some people um, certainly express differently than others. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they are linked to polyamory and, and narcissism. Yeah. Um, but it can also be something that someone who doesn't feel inclined to commit likes to say that they are polyamorous, but they don't have the love connection that a truly polyamorous person does. So there are distinctions. We could talk about all that another day, but let's go yeah. back to um, your, your list of things in this um, book that you've offered. Yeah. Sexual soulmates, the six essentials to connected sex. The next one is embodied sexuality. And this is a very telltale sign of someone who is able to be in their heart versus someone who is not. Mm -hmm. Looking you in the eyes, holding you, touching you for rapture, where they're not just touching you to make your body respond in a way that they want it to respond, but instead they are touching you because it brings them so much pleasure and it brings you pleasure. If you imagine I could touch my skin and I could touch it to just rub it, or I could touch it in a way that makes me feel good when I'm touching you. And when I touch you and it feels good to me, it feels even better to you. It's the difference between taking touch and connected touch. So heart connection, you can feel their love, they express their love, there's verbal appreciation, there's adoration. You, they hold you. you, you know they're loving the touching and the holding that they're giving you. They're looking you in the eyes, your breath is connected, it's slow, it's <coughs> determined, it's pleasurable. This is what embodied sexuality is. Embodied sexuality is not, I have an erection, I throw you down in the bed, I plunge inside you, I have an orgasm and, and then I roll off and walk away. That's terrible behavior. Taking. That's taking. taking. That's, that's abuse, really, is mm -hmm. what it is. It's abuse. And then finally, there's the notion of erotic play dates, that someone is fun to be with, that it's not just they expect me to have sex with them or uh, they've demanded sex three times a week or they've demanded sex every day or they're, I always must give them oral pleasuring before they penetrate me or whatever it might be, but that they want to do fun things together. They want to have sex in new locations. They want to have loving, beautiful spaces. They want to try new things. They're open to new possibilities. They've got ideas and fantasies that they want to share. Um, that's what erotic play dates are. And that's what keeps sex getting better and better and better over time. Yay. <laughs> I can hear the collective yay as people are listening to this. There is a way these things make sense. And then the question is coming up, how do I broach what I've just heard Susan Bratton say yeah. with my partner with whom I have not discussed this kind of possibility? Well, one of the things that the Sexual Soulmate Pact lets you do is uh, it lets you, if you, when you download it, it's it's really a, just a small PDF with an agreement. 
the very first thing that you can do if you have a partner and you want, you're like, I want what she's having. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds very good. I would like to have all that kind of really nice, fun, sweet sex. <laughs> then you can say to your partner, I, I'd like to take our sex life to a whole new level of intimacy and passion. And the very first thing that I want to be able to do is to explore more of what we want in the moment. I want to be able to confidently ask you for what I need and listen to my body. But I also want to learn some new things together. And I was thinking maybe we could we could learn erotic massage. Hmm. Or we could try a sex toy together while we make love. Or we could try some new positions. Would you be open to that? Do you think we could schedule some time? I actually have this funny little calendar here. Check it out. We got all kinds of goodies around here. You wouldn't believe how many goodies I got around here. This is um this is my little sex date, my little erotic play date calendar. And I always say that couples that play together stay together, especially in the bedroom. And what I love about having this is that you can decide, okay, we're going to have these nights or these days or these times to look forward to. We're going to put it on the calendar Thursday evening after dinner. I got this new toy and we're going to play with it and try it and see how it goes. Or, you know, next Saturday, we're going to, I've got this little this little video series called Steamy Sex Ed. We're going to plug in the sensual massage video, or we're going to down, you know, we're going to download it and stream it. And we're, I'm going, you lie there, and I'm going to follow along, and I'm going to do what I see demonstrated on the screen to you, and tell you what I'm doing as I do it, and then you give me feedback and tell me what parts you like the best, and then we'll switch, and you do me. Something like that. If, if you have a partner who's not willing to do those things, that's a red flag. Generally, partners want to do new things. People want to increment their sex life, unless there's, of course, a lot of shame or past abuse or what have you. And then that's where you get into healing sexual trauma, working with whatever kind of therapist, somatic therapist, talk therapist, et cetera, that is going to help you work through those things. Mm hmm. Well, we have certainly given people a lot of food for thought yeah. and some great conversation starters. <laughs> and of course, go, as Susan said, go and uh, download the Sexual Soulmate Pack from Susan. You can find her at SusanBratton.com or go to BetterLover.com and hear what she has to say. All of this. So thank you so much for being with me again. I love being with you. <laughs> and we will have a further conversation, I'm sure, because this is probably going to be one that gets further questions. But there are a couple of questions in the room now. And um, <clears throat> someone says, hello from Canada. Been watching your videos for weeks. Thank you. Well, you're mm -hmm. welcome. <laughs> and uh, Lindsay said, I found a porn video in my husband's history three months ago. Mm -hmm. He's still denying that he had anything to do with it. Mm. And he is lashing out at me. How do I get him to tell me the truth? He's always said that he hates it. It disgusts him. He views it as cheating. This was an established boundary and I'm devastated. Lying, gaslighting, rages, you name it. Well, it's a very difficult one. I, I really feel very badly for, me, for men generally who get sucked into pornography because they're preyed upon by the porn industry because men are biologically wired to need to top up their sperm and keep it fresh. And so they're very driven to masturbate frequently on a daily basis. Most men masturbate every single day. And they it's not welcomed in homes. And so they feel that they have to be furtive about, about it. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that Pornography makes it very easy for them to masturbate quickly and efficiently. And there's so many different kinds of pornography that they can find the kind of thing that really turns them on. And the problem is that the more that men watch porn, the less they become original thinkers of their own fantasies, <laughs> driving their own sex life themselves. Right. But I don't think in today's universe, that you can really expect a male-bodied partner 
to not watch porn once in a while and not ma not masturbate to porn once in a while. It's just so available. It's so endemic and it is so appealing to our partners that mm -hmm. in some ways I feel like maybe in this case, you know, he knows how much you hate it and it was a boundary that he crossed and he does not want you to be upset with him. And there's a possibility that it might benefit you more to just not be so mad about it and to just realize that it's a bigger thing than you can set a boundary for. You know, and I would add this, Susan, because well, Lindsay goes on, as you read, and says that he has always said he hates it and it disgusts him and right. views it as cheating. And that very well may, may be, Lindsay, that that's what he thinks you want him to say. Yeah. And there's a conversation starter right there. You can say, hey, I heard this great video with Susan Bratton today. And she told me what porn has as a use and why it could be a value to us. And I'm thinking I might need some education here. Let's talk about it in a different way and open up the conversation about Oh, I'm not mad about it. I'm interested about it. Let's talk about it. I, I don't think it's something to hide. If I've ever made you feel that it's something to hide, I'm sorry for that. Let's talk about it and invite him to have a refreshed conversation about these things. Yeah. But if you have, Lindsay says now, she said, but he has set this boundary. <laughs> well, again, I understand completely what you're saying, mm -hmm. but Maybe you could have a new conversation. Just yeah. say, are we operating from old premises? Yes. Is, is there something else that we could maybe converse about in a different way, a different angle, if you will, a different point of view as to does the porn bring you pleasure and does it actually affect our intimacy or does it enhance our intimacy? You know, people who are addicted to porn there's so many questions about that and how yeah. how they're feeling about that, why they do it and what, mm -hmm. what it brings for them. Um, there's so many pieces. So I think we could do a reframe on this one, don't you, Susan? Yeah, and I, I also think that it could be that he hates that he watches porn, but he does. It could be that he is really ashamed because he has been told that the, the porn is bad, that porn is wrong. Porn right. is degrading to women. Let's face it. Yeah. Uh, in Time Magazine last year or the year before, they they quoted some research, scientific uh, academics who sampled hundreds and hundreds of porn clips and found that 96% of them were degrading to women. Right. So the bummer is that we have a society of men who've now been raised watching porn but who've also been told that porn is bad and wrong. And so imagine him. Imagine the fact that it's 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 like chocolate cake. You know it's fattening. You know it's sugar. You know it's not good for you. But boy, do you want a bite. I mean, in a way, it's one of those types of things yeah. that it may not be appealing to us as women because it's not designed for us, nor do we have that daily urge to masturbate as much as the broad swath of our male-bodied partners do. So here they have all this temptation, all this shame, and they set this boundary that it was horrible, but then they did it. Mm -hmm. So you've got, your heart's really got a break for guys being stuck in the position of the media industry preying on them and them dealing with their own shame, maybe even their own shame about masturbation when masturbation is completely normal. And if we, if we partners of penis owners could encourage our, <laughs> could encourage our partners to feel more comfortable masturbating and give them the space to do it. And in all honesty, as the vulva owners, if we spent more time masturbating, if we got ourselves a good vibrator and we had a good masturbation session every day, our genitals would be in better condition. Our orgasms would improve. Our general sex life with our partner would be improved. So we've got all this shame around masturbation. And then we've got the media 
preying on our male partners for porn and more and more getting into women, you know, into the women's universe as well. And a lot of women saying, well, I like porn. Porn is really fun. And it's like, there are people who it can work for and there are people where it's too much and only you know where those lines are. But I would I would have a very, very kind heart in talking to my husband about it. And I would, like Roberta said, reframe it and rediscuss it and really be open to it, knowing now some of the things that we've explained to you. Mm -hmm. And Lindsay added one more thing. She said, I think the biggest thing that hurts is the gaslighting, manipulation, verbal abuse, and lies. And that is not connected to the porn, although it may seem to be. Mm -hmm. So if you treat those things as separate issues, maybe the porn turns out to be an example of it or it gets used in that way. But yeah. maybe you want to pay attention less to the porn situation and more to the gaslighting and manipulation because yeah. you have very very valid concerns, Lindsay. I understand that completely. And maybe we need to separate those things out. And you know, if you want to talk about that, you can always uh, use my link, beaclient.com. We can talk about it. You can go to Susan's website. I hope that you do book with Dr. Shaler, Lindsay, because if you're feeling gaslit and lying and manipulating and all those things, you, 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 the porn is a secondary, the porn is a byproduct right. of the larger issue that you definitely need Dr. Shaler's support with. Well, thank you for that plug, Susan. But, you know, it really is important. <laughs> it's really important to deal with these things. Don't yeah. sweep them under the carpet. I'm right. so glad you brought them up, Me Lindsay. Too. And remember, again, Susan and I could talk for forever, and you might want us to, but we're done for today. So thank you for being with us. Remember to find Susan at susanbratton.com or betterlover.com. And you know you can always find me at forrelationshiphelp.com. And if you're listening on Facebook, please like the page that you're on. If you're listening on the YouTube channel, please like and hit the notification button. I do many Facebook Lives, and if you subscribe there, you will always know what's coming up and there'll always be a surprise for you so thank you again susan for being a great guest i'm so pleased that you came back and there are people here endeavoring to get their question in at the last minute um <laughs> But the last person, I don't, I don't know, somebody just wrote in capital letters, no. So I don't know what that's about. And the last person just said, thank you for valuable information. And we'll leave on that note. So Great. thanks to everyone for joining us. And be sure to go and check out Susan at susanbratton.com. Make sure you subscribe so you know when these wonderful events come up. And I'll look forward to talking with you again soon. Take good care. And in the meantime, be very good to yourself because you matter and you yes. need to show yourself you do.